Let's rock and roll. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. All right. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin, and I'm here with Barbara. And together, we both like to welcome you all to our latest Novis, Novich webinar series episode. Sorry about that. Uh, we have with us today author and registered architect Francois Levy to discuss a remodel case study with Vectorworks. Um, using Vectorworks architect uh, Francois, Francois' case study gives you an inside look at a small 1,000 square foot residential remodel, uh, providing a general overview of the project and the application process. Uh, immediately after this, we'll jump into a tutorial on how to use Vectorworks' powerful stair tool as a springboard for a custom open steel chair stair. For those of you who don't know, um, you know our presenter, Francois Levy, uh, is a uh, AIA registered Texas architect and partner in Levy and Kohas Architecture. Uh, he's the author of BIM and Small Scale Sustainable Design and a contributor to the AIA Handbook of Professional Practice, 15th edition. Uh, a longtime Vectorworks user, his work, whether in teaching, research, or architecture, investigates the intersection of design, technology, and sustainability. Uh, today's presentation is about 40 minutes long, and afterwards we'll have a brief Q&A where Francois will answer your questions live. Uh, so submit yours to us at any time in the chat window below. But before we get going with today's presentation, here's an overview of what we do at NoVeg. Now, the NoVeg webinar series is brought to you by NoVeg.com. As one of the largest online design software stores, we offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Uh, to pick up a copy of Vectorworks Architect 2014, you are welcome to call and speak with our specialist, Bob Thayer. You can reach him by his email address, bob at nopitch.com. Uh, and if I understand, Barbara, you have a few things that you would like to plug as well. Sure. I'm mostly here to encourage everybody to visit the Novage blog to get a glimpse at who is changing the world of design one step at a time. You can meet the innovators, the makers, the architects, the VFX artists who work right on the edge of creativity and technology. We have great interviews, great images, and great stories. Come visit us today at blog.novage.com. And to catch up with the latest product promos and Novage webinars, like us on Facebook. That is the fastest way to get all your information and um, don't miss any one of our fantastic webinars. Next week, we're giving you an overview of MacSoft's newly released standalone CAD CAM software, Visual CAD CAM 2014. This new version features five modules that are fully integrated into one software interface. While sold separately, the modules include Visual CAD, Visual Mill, Visual Turn, Visual Nest, and Visual Art. In this webinar, we'll showcase each of the modules and demonstrate their new features and functionality. The webinar is free and will last about one hour, including the Q&A session. To sign up, head over to www.novage.com slash webinar slash 103. We're looking forward to meet you there. Last but not least, today's webinar is being recorded live. If you want to rewatch episode 102 in its entirety, as always, you can find it on our Novage webinar series channel through Vimeo and YouTube. And now I'll leave it um, to you guys. And um, I'm really looking forward to see this presentation. Cool. All right. So, Francois, um, I'll let you take it away. Uh, Thanks very much. Passing the podium to you right about now. All right. All right enjoy, guys. All right. Well, um, good morning or afternoon for everyone, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, Kevin and Barbara, thanks very much for having me today and uh, hosting this. Um, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to show you uh, a remodel project that I did, finished a couple of years ago. And it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, one being I've had this client for about 10 years, so off and on I've sort of looped back to this house and uh, made some some small and some more major architectural intervention so it's it's rare when I get to have a long-term client with a long-term relationship like this and that was kind of fun for me um, another challenge of this project was that um, we were going to gut the entire ground floor but didn't want to disturb anything upstairs uh, other than the stair landing itself 
And I guess what prompted me to bring this project uh, to Kevin and Barbara to, to show you is that I had heard from Kevin that uh, there were some users who were wondering just how do you use Vectorworks for, for remodel. So I'll start by giving you a brief uh, overview of the architectural project, just a few slide images. And then I'm going to open up the Vectorworks file, the final Vectorworks file, and um, kind of do what I call a vivisection, where I'll just sort of uh, take the file apart and show you not so much the specific, all the specific objects and tools, but really give you a sense of how I've organized the file itself with classes and layers and viewports and so forth to present a uh, remodel project where there's some existing conditions to remain, some conditions to be demolished, and then some new construction. Uh, and then finally, uh, the brunt of the sort of nitty-gritty tutorial will be uh, my going through the uh, Vectorworks stair tool, which is really quite powerful and um, also pretty involved. And uh, by showing you that tool, I hope you'll uh, have a greater appreciation for some of the parametric possibilities in Vectorworks. And then I'll compare the stair that I built with the stair tool with a custom modeled stair and sort of show you the pros and cons of, of both approaches. So without uh, much more ado, let me go ahead and uh, get into the, some of the slides. I uh, have to have the uh, obligatory uh, fine print here with a, a copyright statement. Um, <coughs> and so let me start out by giving you a brief introduction to the project itself. So this is a, about a 1934 era house in central uh, Austin, uh, close to the university here. And uh, sort of a gambrel roof uh, design. And you can see the condition in these before slides of this sort of very well lived in chaotic kind of house. Um, previous years had seen some attempt at uh, faux painting and so forth. And uh, it just really wasn't working for the owner anymore as uh, with his life changes and uh, his family the way it, it was at the time. And, and really, it especially wasn't working for, for the owners uh, for their entertaining. It's kind of telling, you can see the and the image on the right, the range is pushed up against the wall there. And uh, my client cooks a lot. And so every time he had house guests, he always had his back to, the, uh, to, his, to his guests. And that just really wasn't working for him. And then we had this stair over here on the left, which I'll get back to the, the solution to the stair. Uh, probably can't tell from the image, but um, there were some irregularities in how the stair had been constructed, and it certainly didn't meet current code um, for, uh, for this project. So uh, to give you a sense of how extensive the project was, uh, here's a, an image of uh, con during construction, obviously. Uh, and it's a telling image for a couple of reasons. One, you can see that um, at least from the exterior, there's really no intervention upstairs. Uh, you can see next to the G and during uh, this um, shower addition that I had done many years before. And uh, here the new steel structure to uh, support the sagging upper floor. And you can see we've entirely gutted the ground floor, except for one room, which is tucked away out of view, it would be off to the right, uh, sort of in the northwest corner. And uh, uh, Terry, the, uh, the contractor, was sort of really had to work hard to try to straighten this old house as much as he could without uh, wrecking everything up above. And uh, these are some of the results. Um, uh, front view of the house, that entry was uh, an earlier project that I had done. Um, new coat of paint and, and so forth, uh, new roof. 
And then here's some of the earlier iterations. Uh, there's that shower to the left that uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, sort of sticking up, uh, bringing in lots of natural light from up above. And then the master bedroom, which is actually part of the same room, the, the master shower, sink, and bedroom all in one space. Uh, and we had vaulted that uh, back in 2002. And uh, client told me later he had some doubts about all of this, uh, but in the end was really thrilled. So he trusted me enough to come back again. And so this is what we did just a couple of years ago. Uh, the um, east facade that you can see here that opens on the backyard, we actually pushed that out about 30 inches. And it seemed uh, questionable, I think, at the time to increase the size of the project by just 30 inches. But it was one of those things where it, without that enlargement, the furniture layout and how you use the space just really didn't work. And so it was a small square footage to add, but really made the spaces work quite well. And then you can see off to the right there, this 14-foot uh, wide uh, nano wall, which really brought the outdoors into the house. And then there's a long stone terrace along uh, that east edge, and we regraded slightly so that uh, you're really just stepping out onto the stone terrace and then a slight step down into the, into the garden. So another challenge of this project was uh, working with another designer. Uh, my client's college uh, roommate had uh, grown up and become uh, a kitchen designer working for uh, Johnny Gray, and uh, he's now on his own. And so he had some really great kitchen designs, and part of the challenge of the project was working with an architect who was based out of Connecticut who was doing the kitchen design and working essentially in 2D with AutoCAD. And here I was in Texas um, using Vectorworks in a largely 3D workflow, and then just working back and forth. And it actually worked out really well and quite successfully. And you'll, you'll see a couple of inserted drawings when I show you the drawing set. But uh, this drum over on the left, uh, range now facing right into the room. You can see my staircase in the background, and then on the right, a new fireplace, um, sort of rebuilt the fireplace at its existing location, brought it down to ground level, and uh, did this sculptural hard plaster and timber finish. And then here's a view inside the living room looking back out into the garden to the east. You can see those nana doors pocketing nicely uh, to the left. There are three of them pocket to the left, and then one slides actually to the right behind the refrigerator. And you can you might get a sense that, you know, had this room been 30 inches smaller, the furniture might just not really have worked out. And then here's the dining area, all open plan. And so where the where the kitchen used to be in the old house, that became living room space, and uh, where the living dining was, a corner of that got dedicated to the kitchen. So because it was pure and beam and we were gutting it anyway, we were able to just put the kitchen where it really needed to be rather than uh, stick to uh, an existing condition. And then finally, a couple of views of that stair that I'm going to get into some more detail in uh, a little bit later. Um, open treads, uh, you can see on the right from the front that it appears that the treads are these heavy timbers, uh, but uh, in the view from underneath the stair, you might be able to tell that those are steel angles that are faced with um, wood flooring that matches the, the new wood floor uh, in the entire downstairs. And the thickness of the tread, of course, um, designed to um, meet code for um, opening space and so forth. So I'll, I'll get a little more into the, the stair object itself soon. But as Kevin mentioned, if you've got some uh, questions, 
Uh, certainly feel free to uh, type them in and uh, most of the questions I'll probably go ahead and answer um, at the end so as to not break my very uh, fragile train of thought and concentration. <clears throat> so having shown you sort of a bit of the project, let me go ahead and um, show you what that looks like <clears throat> in, uh, in the Vectorworks uh, file itself. So I'll be uh, sort of picking apart the um, actual submittal for permitting and construction on this small project and sort of explain to you how I uh, assemble that organizationally. So I make an extensive uh, use of sheet layers uh, in uh, Vectorworks. So if you go, uh, if I go down here to the uh, layer pull down menu, you can see that I have my deliverables, site plan, demolition plan, and so forth. Uh, at, set up as sheet layers, and then I have a variety of design layers that is where most of the work actually takes place uh, and then gets presented in a sheet layer. So on this uh, landscape plan, for example, um, I uh, have a viewport, which let me go ahead and show that to you in the object info palette. And you can see it's a viewport at um, 3 16th scale over here. Let me go ahead and turn on uh, my mouse pose and hopefully that'll, that'll help you see what's going on. So I've got this, um, uh, this viewport which I've set to an appropriate scale. And then you can see the layers that populate that viewport. So uh, I want to go ahead and show the kitchen plan for context but I've uh, graded out as you can see over here. And then I have uh, my site plan, of course, and my new and existing uh, floor plans. And that's a 2D viewport. And then if I double click on the viewport, you can see that from the edit viewport dialog box, I can either edit the annotations or the crop or use that to navigate to the viewport itself. So let me go ahead and open up the annotations. And you can see, um, that uh, the text objects, the callouts, the arrows, uh, the dimensioning, all of that is within the uh, annotation space of that viewport. It's not on a design layer. And the reason I set it up that way is so that uh, if I need to have dimensioning that's relevant to, say, the site plan, I can go ahead and put that on the site annotation and then I don't have to worry about those site plan dimensions or notes showing up on my architectural floor plan or, or vice versa. So to, to, to illustrate that, let me go over to, uh, to the site plan. Slightly different, here we've got the entire site at a slightly different scale. And uh, you can see that I don't have the majority of the dimensions here. Um, this is an existing structure, so there's very little that I have to uh, dimension on the site plan. And really, most of the site plan is designed to satisfy permitting requirements. So for example, I've got my floor area ratio calculations to ensure the, uh, reviewing, the plan reviewer that I'm not exceeding the 40% floor area ratio. And I've got a worksheet here for impervious cover. Uh, I've got a 45% limit, so I'm really uh, pushing it there. And um, you can see that there's some, uh, some areas, for example, I have existing parking and walks to remain, so there was actually originally more impervious cover. But over here, uh, you can see where um, uh, I've removed a portion of it in order to um, meet that 45% limit. <clears throat> but these, uh, these worksheets allow me to uh, do simple calculations. So in some cases, I might simply type in a value for the building footprint after the demolition because I know that's not going to change. But for something that's dynamic, 
for example, as I'm designing, I may be constantly changing the amount of uh, impervious cover in the landscaping plan. Um, I may have uh, some string of uh, vector script here so that as I'm redesigning, that calculation can be updated. And then I can be sure that I'm not inadvertently going over my impervious cover in this case. So the really great thing about Vectorworks is that I can create these worksheets or reports that query various geometries of the model and can represent them in a worksheet um, uh, in real time. Um, similarly, there's a rainwater harvesting calculator here for the harvesting off of this two-story studio in the back and uh, trying to figure out what size cistern uh, we needed. So again, using these worksheets in Vectorworks is really uh, quite nice. And then if I uh, navigate over here to my ground floor plan, you can see that uh, there's a couple of things going on. Um, here's a good example where I have rendered uh, an existing condition wall here in this lighter pochet. And then I have new conditions in a heavier pochet so that it's obvious what's new and what's existing. And then you can see that the kitchen has really come in as a line drawing. It doesn't have any of the graphic characteristics that uh, you'll see from some of my uh, objects that I've drawn natively within Vectorworks. So let's look at the uh, layer organization or the, uh, the layer makeup for this uh, ground floor plan. Right? So if I go to layers over here, you can see that I've got a, a design layer for my new conditions downstairs, the kitchen, and then existing conditions. So I can double click on the site, on the uh, viewport, excuse me, to go to that layer. So let's start with the existing conditions. And then under my view options, I'm going to set my layer views to gray snap others so that you can see the context of what's in another layer. And in fact, if I want to, I can even sort of pull this up in a 3D view and then uh, render it in OpenGL, something uh, kind of not, not terribly intensive. And so you, see, you can see that I've modeled some of the building, not with a high degree of fidelity, because I'm not really uh, producing any exterior elevations here. It's essentially an interior project. Um, and the layers, um, the other layers are shown gray, so that's why that stair is ghosted in. And so very quickly you can get a sense of what's existing and remaining and what is going to be new construction. So over here under the uh, new construction plan, right now it's reversed, so you're seeing new construction, solid, and then the existing conditions grayed in. And where I need to model things in 3D, I have. So uh, that stair is modeled in 3D, for example. Um, you can see that I've modeled uh, this small powder bath. Uh, but things that aren't going to show up in the drawing set except in plans, so uh, this cabinetry in this bedroom that we leave alone, I'm not taking the trouble to model that because I know it's not going to show up in any of my uh, deliverables and it's not really impacting the design. So I'm being selective about what I'm modeling and, and what I'm not modeling. And then over here you can see that uh, uh, my um, collaborating architect, Chuck Wheelock, uh, who's designed this kitchen uh, over at uh, Wheelock Medic in uh, Connecticut, uh, his drawing is just brought in as a DWG. I'm not showing any kitchen renderings. That's sort of his, his purview. I just want to make sure that when I do my lighting layout that everything registers appropriately and is well coordinated, that um, in plan my stair isn't interfering with the kitchen design and so forth. So here, if I go to the plan kitchen, uh, you can see that that is just a reference viewport. So I've taken his DWG file. Uh, that he gave me. I imported it into Vectorworks and saved it to one side. 
uh, as it saved it as a separate file. And let's go ahead and go to uh, my organization palette and show you that reference. So it's a broken link because I haven't updated it, but um, over in organization and references, you can see that I've got his kitchen design that's uh, imported as a Vectorworks file, and then it's placed as a viewport on my drawing. And as he gives me updates to his kitchen design, I can just re-import it into Vectorworks and save it in the same file name and the same path, and then whenever I update the viewport, then those changes will be reflected um, over here. Now back to the sort of remodel aspect, uh, those, that's the layer structure of the existing uh, conditions. I'm going to go to view and show you uh, the active layer only. And um, let's uh, go ahead, I'm going to play with lighting just to make things a little bit brighter. There we go. <coughs> so you can see that everything that is being uh, demoed or removed has been removed. Let's go over to the navigation menu and you can see that I've got a couple of demolition classes that I set up. So um, one of the great things about Vectorworks is that it's extremely flexible. It allows me to um, draw or model things in a variety of different ways. And one of the issues or, or um, challenges, I guess, is that Vectorworks is extremely flexible. In other words, uh, there's lots of different ways to achieve the same ends, and sometimes users wonder, well, when should I use classes and when should I use layers? And I think this is a good illustration of um, an appropriate response, at least for this kind of project. So I have kept, I've di differentiated new and existing conditions on two separate layers um, because that represents a, a phase of construction um, or a locale. For example, everything on the, on the ground floor. But I've assigned the typology of objects to classes. So windows go to a window class, doors go to a door class, and so forth. Um, when I'm removing something, I assign it to one of two demolition classes, really for graphic reasons only. And so now when I turn on my demolition classes, you can see that I modeled, for example, if you'll recall the uh, photos that I showed you at the beginning of my talk, there was that bulkhead that was uh, carrying uh, an HVAC duct. So I modeled that in 3D. I showed the existing doors and windows over here. Right? There was even a little uh, water heater closet at, at the back that we, that we blew out. The stair got drafted as a 2D object only. I didn't really spend a lot of time modeling the existing stair because I knew I was going to tear it out. And so by assigning these objects to a demolition class, um, I can simply turn those objects off. So for example, there's a little short piece of wall here that I've cut out in order to place a tall vertical window later. So I've removed that whole piece of wall and I'm going to come back and fill it in with a new wall. If I go to my new layer, there's that new piece of wall with the window that goes into it. But that short piece of wall is demoed out. If I go to uh, view and go to a standard top plan view, you can see that that demolition class has characteristics. Um, namely, that wall has no fill, and then it just shows up as a heavy dashed line. And then other objects that get, uh, that get demoed, uh, this kitchen cabinetry, this sink, all of that has a slightly lighter line weight. And so I don't have a demolition class for doors and then a separate demolition class for plumbing and a separate demolition class for windows. I suppose that I could, but my thinking is if it's demoed, it's going out. So I don't really need to differentiate, at least for a project of this complexity, plumbing demolition versus electrical demolition versus cabinetry demolition. It's all demo. And I simply have some line weights uh, for walls 
that are demoed versus everything else just to make the drawings a little bit more legible. And so I've really organized this, uh, this whole remodel as essentially a couple of layers uh, for the 3D model or the, the, the primary drawings, the plans and so forth. Uh, new conditions and existing conditions. Um, and within the existing conditions, I document everything that I feel is, is relevant. And then once I've documented it, I go ahead and assign things that are being demolished to a demolition class. If later it turns out that we're going to keep that wall, then um, I can go back and reassign that wall to, say, a wall existing class. And then you can see that uh, graphically it shows up like the other walls. And so let's let's look at the demolition plan. So here, if I show you that viewport, it's the demolition plan, and there's a ground floor demolition plan viewport. And if I look at the layers, I'm only showing the existing layer. I'm not showing the kitchen or the new, obviously. And I've got the demolition uh, class turned on. So this HVAC unit is shown, windows are shown, doors are shown, and so forth. And uh, calling out some notes uh, using the call out tool. So uh, here's a note over here to the right, and it populates a, a database. And then I can show those notes as um, either calling them out as text, so I could deselect places keynote, and then we see the whole text there, for example. Or uh, I could show it as a keynote, and then it will populate this demolition notes um, keynote legend uh, right there on the sheet. And if I want to, I could put those notes within the annotation space of uh, the viewport. That's fine, too. It can, can work either way, either inside or outside the viewport. But then looking at the architectural plan, again, that same demolition, uh, or I'm sorry, existing conditions layer shows up, uh, plan one existing. Only in this case, if we look at the classes, the demolition classes are turned off in that viewport. And so now all I see is the uh, new conditions overlaid on top of the ex existing conditions to be, um, to, to remain. Oh, and incidentally, uh, in addition to bringing in a DWG from the, um, uh, my uh, collaborator, uh, Chuck Wheelock on this, um, if you've ever worked with Nanowall, you know that they produce some pretty detailed shop drawings and that every, every unit can be custom. And so I modeled an approximation of the Nanowall using the Vectorworks um, door tool. But then to make sure that all of my tolerances and clearances were right, I took the uh, shop drawing that they provided, which uh, carries plenty of detail, right? And uh, I brought that in as a DWG that was referenced, just like I did uh, the kitchen plan. And so I could uh, make sure that um, when things pocketed, they fit the way they were supposed to. And uh, that, that my sort of rough model corresponded to the reality of how they would detail that. Um, for, for lighting, of course, that's another sheet layer with viewports. And here it's once again a condition of being selective of what classes display. So now I've got some electrical and ceiling information classes uh, that uh, are turned on. But essentially this is the same, uh, these are the same layers that we see uh, in, the, in the floor plan. I'm just selective about what I'm turning off and on uh, in the viewport with classes. And uh, here are some interior elevations. 
So over here I've got a, a rendering of the stair. That's a viewport directly from the model. If you look closely, you'll see there's no kitchen back there. Um, I could have modeled it, of course, but um, a Wheelock Medique work essentially in, in 2D, and so it was uh, fine with me to just leave that out of the rendering in the background. Um, and then I've got interior elevations, for example, of this guest bath, and that's a combination of 2D and, and 3D objects. That's a section viewport taken on the plan, so let's look over here on the ground floor plan. And you can see where that is keyed in right over here. And so that, that section, that interior elevation marker, the 3A3, isn't just an indicator on the plan uh, that there's a, a section viewport um, or an interior elevation in this case, but it is doing the actual section. So where I place that is significant. Uh, and then if we look at the annotation space on there, you can see that I've applied some hatches um, to um, render the tile, for example, in addition to the 3D basic 3D geometry, which is sort of under that. Uh, and likewise, with these interior elevations, the cabinetry that you see here for the media cabinet is um, uh, a Vectorworks object that we're seeing in elevation, so is the window here, but then I've drawn the dimensions um, and so forth over on top of it. So all of these are, are viewports. Here's a uh, detailed plan uh, with all of the dimensions that uh, really don't fit very nicely on this uh, small format. Uh, so detailed plan of the stair and uh, this uh, new closet and uh, shower and uh, powder room. <coughs> and again, that interior elevation is that marker there that I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to is linked dynamically to the viewport uh, that's, that's over here. And naturally, if we look at the layers that are represented in that viewport, right, the new and the existing, I've got the the kitchen plan shown, but really um, that's just sloppy on my part. I don't really need to. Um, so that's, that's really the idea of how I've assembled this set, really just a couple of layers, uh, the site um, uh, and ground floor conditions, and then everything is uh, taken as an interior elevation or a section viewport from that uh, or an enlarged plan, and then differentiating existing versus new conditions as two separate layers and classifying objects appropriately in order to represent uh, demolition versus uh, proposed conditions. So um, for um, our remaining time, what I'd like to do is sort of focus on this, on this stair object. So I've got a sample file here that I've pulled out. And um, in fact, I think that um, Kevin is going to be able to post that file if you want to uh, uh, grab it. Uh, if you're a Vectorworks 2014 user, you can grab that file and sort of um, take it apart yourself and look at it uh, at your leisure. Uh, but what I have here is a, a, a stair condition and a stair design uh, that I've developed that uh, I can get close with the Vectorworks object, but, but not 100%. For example, the fact that the stair has a a changing width here is, is a bit of an issue. Um, and so what I'm showing you here in the uh, top two renderings, these are two views of the uh, stair that I modeled by hand, uh, as it were. So everything is a, is a custom modeling operation. And then down below is a stair that is built using the uh, Vectorworks uh, Architect stair object. And um, I've tried to approximate the parameters of that stair as closely as possible to represent uh, the, the final stair. So uh, the reason I'm, I'm showing you this is because you might start out with a general idea of the design of your stair and start out using a parametric stair object to get you, you know, 90 or 95 percent of the way there. 
And then once you've settled on that design, once you, you're assured that your stair meets code, then you have appropriate uh, head clearance and tread and riser dimensions and landing clearances and so forth. Then you might go ahead and ungroup that uh, or um, create a, a non-parametric, just a plain 3D object from it. So let me, let me go over and use this viewport to navigate over to the stair itself and show you some of the features of the stair tool. Go to a less intensive rendering mode here. And um, so <coughs> I'm remove the perspective crop here. You can see uh, I've, uh, I've kept a column. Um, you can see one one sort of key feature that this stair doesn't really uh, doesn't really work is it looks fine over uh, from this side, but you can see that the stair is a fixed width, um, not able to have it uh, splay out to fit that wall. So I've just overshot the wall, and then later when I've decided that the stair works out, I can go ahead and clip these these objects out. But let's let's look at the stair object in some detail and and different aspects of uh, setting it up. So it's called out as a stair. It has a, sign, uh, a class assigned to it and a layer. And then if I look at the settings, you'll see that I get this really uh, bewildering array of, of options. And um, a lot of users might sort of pop open the stair tool and just get overwhelmed and then <laughs> walk away from it, uh, which is um, too bad because it's a really powerful tool, very helpful. And again, it, where I find it really shines is um, helping me to express a general design intent and making sure that I'm meeting code for the stair. So under the general conditions of the stair setting, you can see that I can specify an overall stair width here and um, I can also specify a riser height and a tread depth. Now these are very important because um, down below I've got a minima and maxima values that I can edit. And so I can specify that the minimum tread depth, for example, for local code is 10 inches and the maximum riser height is 7 and 3 quarters or whatever is appropriate. And uh, there are some preset styles. So there's a residential US and a residential uh, UK and commercial US standards. So for example, I can look at commercial standards and now the maximum riser height will drop to seven inches for commercial US rather. Um, and of course, uh, as the architect, it's your responsibility to make sure that those are actually current and applicable to your jurisdiction. Um, so. Um, so long as you use these minima and maxima values, the stair will reshape itself to change the number of risers um, as needed in order to meet the general conditions. And in this case, I have everything on more or less one story. There is a second story, but I haven't modeled it. And so I've just typed in the measured floor-to-floor -floor height in order to make sure that my stair works out. But um, on other projects, I may have the stair run from two different layers on two different stories. And as I change the floor to floor height between those stories, the stair would reshape itself. Um, so I could do that by layer elevation, for example, and specify the top layer, uh, the top boundary, and the bottom boundary. And that's really useful too. Again, in early design, as I'm exploring what are my floor-to-floor -floor heights, what are my ceiling heights, and so on. And then I have some general settings in terms of uh, how I'm going to orient uh, the views. And so I may decide that I always want to see that as a, a left isometric, for example, or <coughs> a right isometric in my in my preview window. Um, and then finally, the other thing I want to point out in this dia this pane of the dialog box is that not every stair is a straight run stair, obviously. And so I have some standard configurations 
of some default stairs that I can start from um, that you can see here. And if I choose, for example, to change that from a straight run stair to a straight with a landing, um, these are all of the settings that I can decide to carry over from one version of that stair or the other. And obviously, if I make a radically different selection of stair type from a circular straight stair to a circular stair, things like uh, tread height uh, minima, uh, tread and, and riser minima and maxima, those are going to be different for a different uh, stair configuration. And so I may need to proceed with cost, caution. But if I'm just starting out a new project and I say, huh, I need a stair here, I can go right to this dialog, this pane of the dialog box, pick the stair that I think that I need, and use that as a starting point. And that's a huge time saver. So in the geometry tab, uh, we have some uh, repetition of some of the same information that we had in the, in the general tab. And here it's going to give me the number of risers. And so I could uh, tell Vectorworks I don't want 15 risers. I want 19 risers, for example. Um, and then you can see that Vectorworks says, well, because uh, I, the lock tab is here on the riser height and the tread depth, those are fixed. So if I'm changing the number of risers and riser and tread are fixed, the only thing that can change is the floor to floor height. So it's automatically recalculated what the floor to floor height uh, would be for that condition. Or I could say, no, I'm going to relax my riser height limitation. I'm going to increase the number of risers to say 17. And you see that Vectorworks has recalculated the riser height based on a fixed floor-to-floor uh, -floor height and the number of risers that I've selected. Then the stair is a, a, a hybrid object. That is to say it shows up in plan view as one, in one way and it shows up in 3D views as a 3D model. And so I have a variety of settings here which allow me to specify what the 2D graphics of that stair are. Do I see it on the lower floor and the upper floor or just the lower floor? Is there a break? Do I see what is below the break line only or above, dashed, and so forth? Um, what is the break height going to be? Perhaps I want to make that break elevation four feet. And so now when I change it to four feet, you can see that the preview is changing. If I make it 24 inches, it's one thing. If I make it eight feet, it's another. And I can specify the angle of that break line. Um, um, I can show stringers or not. In this case, the stringer is outside the stair and the treads are spanning between it. So I want to show it and I want to show the handrail, but I may want a real simple view of the stair and not show those things. <coughs> and then for construction, I have a variety of options for whether it's a solid stair, the stringer is underneath, whether there are two or three or one stringer, or in this case, whether the stringer is outside. And so that's the selection that I made here. Um, I had a steel section in mind that I wanted to use. And so uh, while the stair isn't showing as a, a C channel, it's showing as a solid beam, I can at least get the right overall dimensions for the stringer depth and the width for the C channel that I have selected. And you can see here all of the different parameters that I can change. Now here I want an open riser. And so what I've done is I've simply changed the riser. I could turn off the riser or I've changed the riser thickness to zero. So essentially there is, there is no riser. Uh, and I made the tread thickness three and three quarters so that I have uh, four inches or slightly less. And then I need, I need code with my uh, opening. Now, all of these things are settings. Uh, you know, as you start to go through these panes, you may see that there are a variety of different settings here, uh, quite a few of them. And while some of them are going to change from project to project, many of them may be the same. You may have a certain style of stair that you like using on multiple projects or multiple stairs within the same project. And so here's where these uh, st style elements really come in handy. You can see that I've got uh, some construction styles uh, that are uh, preset, right? Uh, and I can also uh, create my own style, and then I could save 
that style. So I'll just name that um, open stair. And so now I could change the stringer depth to say 18 inches, but say, well, no, I don't want those conditions. I want to go back to the open stair conditions that I had previously saved. So now I'm just going to choose open stair, and you can see that all of these values are now put back to what they were when I saved that style. And if I want to change that style, like I've decided that open stair should have a 12-inch stringer instead of a 10-inch stringer depth, I can just save it again uh, with the same name, and then Vectorworks will allow me to overwrite that old style with the new version of that style. Likewise, uh, I've got a variety of options for railings. So um, here's where um, there's, a, there's a great deal of customization that's, that's going on. I've got a, a handrail here, and I can show a handrail either to the left uh, or to the right or both sides. So uh, in this case, uh, I'm just showing a handrail on the right, and for the left, I'm going to deselect show handrail and you can see that handrail goes away on the little preview dialog box. Likewise for the guardrail, I want a guardrail uh, on the left but I don't want one on the right so I will remove the guardrail, oops sorry, keep it on the left, remove it on the right. So for the right railing I will deselect show guardrail. Oh. Sorry, I'm getting myself confused here. No left railing. There we go. So no left railing, yes to a right railing. And so when I could change the settings so I could have one kind of railing on one side and a different kind of railing on the other simply by toggling between these two radio buttons and then changing the parameters. So for that handrail, if I look at the position, you can see that I have a specific height. The handrail position is either beside the stair or on the stair, or I could just offset it from the tread edge, uh, which is what I've done. And uh, I've given it some dimensions that are appropriate, and I can extend the handrail at the bottom of the stair, for example, like this. And you can see that I've got a little bit of an extension here in the preview window, or at the top of the stair, or neither. Uh, for the guardrail, over on the right side, I'm showing it, so it's there. And in this case, I've specified a height because I've got this solid panel, and later I'll model some uh, horizontal uh, elements. And the top rail of that stair is going to be rectangular with these dimensions. It starts and ends at the tread. Um, instead of being... Um, uh, a frame with uh, horizontals or verticals, which I could choose. I'm doing a solid panel here. And uh, placing posts approximately every three feet, and Vectorworks will work that out to be some even uh, number of treads. And again, a lot of settings here, but uh, you can see that I have, um, can go ahead and save all of my settings as a, another, so open stair, for example, create a new style, and now anytime I want to reapply that to another stair in my, on my computer, I can just pull down that, um, that setting. And then for graphic attributes, you can see that, for example, I've assigned a glazing translucent class to the frame, both to the right and to the left. And so that's what makes those panels look like glass. They're assigned to a class that has a glass texture assigned to it. I have a notes architectural class that I want for my uh, 2D stair break, walk line, and any data that's displayed in 2D view of the stair. I want the guardrail and the post to show up in this material steel class. So, for example, if I double-click on the post, you can see that I can assign it to a class here and make all the conditions, uh, the characteristics fill and color 
either by class or I can make them uh, custom. Some custom color, for example. And it takes a while to go through and set all of the classes that I want for all of these different conditions, both 2D and 3D. But once I've done that um, the first time around, uh, I can go ahead and uh, manage my styles. Uh, I can go ahead and save that as a style, call that open stair. And I have a different style for each one of these tabs, right? So create a new style, open stair. And so now, uh, every time I want that stair to have these characteristics, I just uh, go to the open stair tab, uh, style and select it. And so having done all that, here's, uh, here's my stair. And you can see that there are some important uh, differences between it and the final stair. There's no real way to um, model. Um, there's no real way to model that intermediate rail here with the stair tool. And so oh, that's something that I'm going to have to go back and add later or figure out another way to make that, that up. And so there, there are some ways in which this stair, uh, very critical ways in which this stair do, doesn't really work uh, in representing uh, the details of my design intent, but there are some important ways in which it makes creating a stair very, very easy. So for example, uh, an obvious one is I can just change the floor to floor height. So again, I'll uh, change that to say 12 feet. And Vectorworks will prompt me and tell me uh, 7 and 3 quarter rises doesn't go into 12 feet, uh, an even number. So do I want to change that to 12 and 12 foot 3 and a quarter or change the rise to 7.579 inches? So I'll change the rise. And so now the stair reshapes. You see how it's just reshaped itself parametrically. And uh, the angle of the stair has changed. The angle of the guardrail and all of those different elements have changed. On the other hand, if we look at the stair that I made as a custom model, let's make that active only. There that is. So that's a, a 2D symbol or a 2D, 3D symbol. So if I double click on it and look at the 3D components, you can see that I have uh, uh, built this stair um, reasonably accurately. So I have some steel angles as extrusions for the treads, but the wood that is on top of the steel structure uh, has a slight uh, angle to it. I've gone ahead and modeled those intermediate rails. I've even gone overboard and modeled the bracket. But um, that's all great. Uh, the C channel looks good. So given that this stair is going to show up in multiple views, perspectives, um, renderings to the client, uh, sections, elevations, and details, it's important for me to um, uh, show all of that in that kind of detail, or at least it was important for me personally to. But if I was in a situation where suddenly that stair had to uh, change to accommodate a different floor to floor height, for example, or um, uh, there was a desire to have a different rise or a different tread. Suddenly, all of that 3D modeling, um, it's not completely lost, but it uh, largely has to, be, has to be redone. And so the, the power that I get in terms of having a great deal of detail and control is offset by the lack of automation. And that's going to be true in any kind of 3D modeling exercise. I can use a parametric door, for example, to create a close approximation <coughs> of a nano wall, but it's not necessarily going to be exactly right. And if I need it to be exactly right, I may need to go and create uh, this kind of a custom 3D object. And the great thing about Vectorworks is it gives me both options. I can start out with a stair <coughs> using the parametric tool that gets me 90% you know, of the way there, 95% of the way there. And then when I'm ready to add a lot of detail to that model, when I've gone beyond the conceptual or schematic design or design development phase, I can go ahead and ungroup that object and then use that to refine uh, my model. So. Um, 
I really appreciate your your time. We're uh, we're right at about an hour, and I had uh, <coughs> apologized for going a little little over, but I'd really love to answer any questions uh, that you have. Um, so uh, please, if you have some questions, uh, go ahead and send them to Kevin, and uh, we can read them, and I can try to answer them for you. Thanks very much. Cool. So, um, hey, Francois, I have some questions uh, submitted to your uh, chat window. Uh, I have this first one. This is from William. Uh, why didn't you convert the 2D kitchen into Vectorworks 3D objects so the owner could see the kitchen in 3D? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, because the owner, the Chuck was not my consultant. He wasn't behind the scenes. This was really um, a collaborative effort where he was working in the kitchen, and he had the, you know, his way of working and his way of presenting, um, and uh, and I had mine. So in some situations, I would absolutely take that kitchen and model it. But Chuck and my client already had a relationship, and he was already showing them their rendering. So it would certainly be, under certain conditions, be really appropriate for me to do that. But in this case, um, Chuck already had that covered in, with his own methodology. Um, so that's, that's why. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to scroll through some of these. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, Kevin, you mind if I jump in and answer a couple of these? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, so, so uh, Charles writes, when do you use unified view and how do you set the unified view options? So unified view is, uh, is a view option whenever you, let me go back to my remodel file here, and uh, let's go to uh, what I was showing you before. So here's an isometric view, and uh, we'll uh, gray others. And you can see that I've got three different layers turned on, uh, or two at least, uh, the plan, the new, and the existing layers. If I have unified view turned on, uh, sorry, under view, unified view, right, or um, I can click this button over here in the top right view. Whenever I move one layer, the other layer moves with it as if they were essentially one layer. If I have that turned off, however, right, you can see that I'm moving the active layer, but the other layer is not moving, which is potentially very disorienting. And uh, under view, I have unified view options, and I can show screen objects, i.e. 2D objects, uh, or not, on the active plane or not. And then I can ignore layers with different scale uh, and other options as well. I don't generally want to ignore layers with different scales because, for example, I want the floor plan and or the ground floor and the site plan to show together in a unified view. So that's what unified view does is it let me click that and you can see the other layer just snaps into place. It allows uh, all the other visible layers to follow along at the same scale view and rendering style as the, uh, the main the, the active layer. Uh, another question is do I use stories when setting up a document? Absolutely. Stories are a really useful tool. Um, uh, a story is really sort of a meta layer. It's a collection of layers. So you could have a ground floor story that would include a, a foundation component below the floor plane, ceiling components above the floor plane, and so on and so forth. The real strength of stories is when you get with multi-story projects where you anticipate that you might have some change. So for example, uh, on another project I'm currently working on, it's a tiny little um, studio uh, house, but there's some question as to what the ceiling heights are going to be uh, in design. So by assigning the three different levels, ground floor, upper floor, and roof to stories, I can uh, just quickly change the story height and then every layer that belongs to that story follows along with it. Uh, really great tool. Um, uh, 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 Dick Jenkins has a quick question. When my plans go out to pricing and permitting, do, uh, do I print them in, in color? Uh, yeah, I use a lot of color for my own use on screen to sort of differentiate. 
um, between objects. I generally print in black and white. Uh, the exception to that is uh, elevations and sections. Lately I've been experimenting with showing elevations and sections in full color. And the reason for that is um, the color helps the model show or the elevations show depth and uh, distance. Uh, and so rather than overlay a lot of 2D drawing on top of the 3D model to sort of convey depth, uh, I'm using shadows and, and color to do that. And so far it seems to be pretty successful. Um, so let's see, another question is, uh, when I bring in a DWG from AutoCAD, do I use it to bring it into a blank document first, then reassign classes, um, or or not? Well, that's a great question. So let's go over to the Plan One Kitchen layer here, and you can see here's a viewport. And so there's a viewport of uh, Chuck's drawing, and if I look at the classes, you can see that there's a lot of AutoCAD class what AutoCAD calls layers, but what we would call classes in Vectorworks. There are a lot of AutoCAD layers or classes that are assigned to this drawing. On the other hand, if you look at my class setup here, you won't find any of those AutoCAD classes in my class setup. I have it set up using my own system, right? And so the advantage of importing that kitchen into a blank file and then using a reference viewport to bring it in is that I can quarantine all of those AutoCAD classes in the document uh, or in the viewport rather and they don't spill over into my document so I don't have to scroll through you know a couple of hundred of somebody else's classes just to find mine and then I can override all of those so for example I can change the color of that class from yellow to magenta and from 0.15 to point eight and uh, those classes will be overridden so not only can I quarantine their classes but I can uh, control their their graphic attributes and that partly probably because I'm a control freak but but mostly it's because um, you know the drawing is maybe produced for them uh, with the intention of being at a certain scale where certain light line weights work but maybe I'll use that same drawing at a different scale and they want to change the line weights uh, so that's a really good question. Um, uh, do I ever use the custom stair tool and the stair and custom stair name should be switched? Don't you think? Um, the custom stair tool, uh, Will's right about that. The name should be switched. The custom stair tool is actually a simpler version and um, I don't really use it much because while the, the stair tool has a lot more settings, because I can save all of those settings with styles, um, it really does, in spite of all of the dialog panes, uh, panes in the dialog box, that's P-A-N-E, uh, in the dialog box, it really does streamline using that tool uh, a tremendous amount. So tedious to set up the first time, but um, uh, really useful. And if you don't have Vectorworks Architect, then you have the custom stair tool, not the stair tool. Uh, let's see, do I find the custom modeling more valuable for selling to the client or coordination with the builder? Where would a line drawing for the stair detail be easier or more difficult? Well, I think it's both. Uh, I, the, the detailed stair is useful for me as a design medium modeling in 3D. Uh, as opposed to just drawing in 2D. Um, so as a design medium, I find the 3D model to be helpful. It is more um, uh, illustrative and or clear communication for the client, and it does help the contractor as well. Um, so for example, if we go back to say my stair detail sheet, which I hadn't shown you earlier, this elevation here of the stair, or section elevation I should say, is taken from the model. And in fact, that handrail detail is taken from the model, uh, though it really wouldn't need to be. And uh, this tread section detail is also taken from the model. So I've added some hatching um, 
to render the steel and so forth, but essentially this is taken from the model. And so by working out those relationships in 3D, I can appreciate how they uh, are going to play out in all three dimensions, but then I can take a little snippet of the model, uh, put it in a section viewport, and then I've got um, the basis for um, a detail. So not all my details are going to be from the model, but in this case I developed a pretty, a pretty detailed model, as you can see, and so I was able to section that model in order to derive the details. Uh, what is placed in the demolition spec class? Uh, Tally asked. Basically, walls I put in the demolition main class, and I put everything else in the demolition spec class. That's probably not how it was originally intended, but that's just how I do it. Um, so, could I go through the steps again for turning the stair pie into something you could use to create the stair? Well, uh, I didn't show it the first time, but yeah. So, what I would do with uh, the stair pie, for example, let me go back and exit the symbol and go over to the uh, plugin object. So there's the stair. If I want to, if I'm satisfied with where it is and I want to just turn it into a, a 3D object that I can freeform model, I would just uh, go to modify and ungroup that. And uh, when I ungroup it, uh, each of these elements is now distinct. So I can double click, there's the stair, so I can delete uh, the stringers, right, or I can go uh, into that mesh and just grab the stringers for um, half of it and delete all that. So exit that group. All right. And then I could uh, draw, for example, a, a profile of the wall um, from endpoint to endpoint and take that and extrude it. And so now I've got this uh, solid object. I should probably close that extrusion. I realize I'm, I'm going quickly, and I apologize, um, given the amount of time that we have. So I'm just going to cut that extrusion. And then uh, here is uh, a mesh. So I'll paste it in place and click on that and the mesh. And under Model, I'll subtract solids. And uh, there's, there are my treads that are uh, extruded. And so now um, here's that stair, and it's no longer um, uh, violating uh, the wall. So uh, let's see. Let me go with one more question, then I think I've got a... Um, uh, let you all go. So let's see. Uh, uh, so, oh, question. How do I correct the holes in the walls after turning off the demolition uh, wall class? Well, I've got a new wall that I've put in the uh, existing, uh, on the, I'm sorry, not, I have a new wall that I place in the uh, new layer, and so uh, that wall uh, plugs the hole created by the old wall. Sometimes there's a bit of an, an artifact line that I may need to mask out, but usually it uh, works out pretty tightly. Well, um, thanks again, Kevin. Um, sorry I went a little over time, and hopefully you learned a couple of extra things, and um, I'm, uh, as Kevin mentioned, I guess this will be posted, and so you can uh, review the video and also would encourage you to um, email me uh, if you've got any questions or um, have any comments about uh, about my little talk today. Thanks again very much. Thank you, Francois. Uh, thank you, Francois. Um, yeah, so as Francois, hmm. uh, yeah, uh, so as um, Francois mentioned, there is a, a, a file that's uh, uploaded on Dropbox. I have a link in the webinar follow-up. So uh, if you guys uh, check it out the day afterwards, it, it's going to be there. It's a quick download. So um, Francois, if it's OK, I will switch back to my screen. Cool. There we go. Go right ahead. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So yeah. Um, 
big thank you. Uh, thank you for everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Um, so the webinar is recorded. It will be up live uh, by today's end. Um, so yeah, so submit your questions to me or Francois, and I'll be sure, I'll be more than happy to um, get Francois to try to answer them as much as possible. And if I understand correctly, um, Francois, you also have a user group in Texas as well? Yeah, I'm trying to not unmute myself. Okay, can you hear me? There's no cat in the background, so I think uh, you can probably, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Cool. Yeah, good. Okay. No, I thought I thought I was mute. Uh, anyway, uh, no. yes, I've I've got a. Uh, I'm the leader for the Austin VectorWorks user group. Uh, we meet in Austin at the AIA office here on um, I think the third Thursday of the month uh, around lunchtime. So uh, look for me on the user group list and um, uh, off the VectorWorks site. You should be able to find me. Cool. Uh, but yeah, by the way, I want to mention that um, today's webinar series is brought to you by Novich.com. Uh, we are one of the largest online design software services. So if you guys are looking to pick up a version of VectorWorks Architect 2014, uh, you can speak to our specialist Bob there. You can reach him at bob at Novich.com. And I also want to shout out to uh, FrancoisLevy.com, which is Francois Levy's website. Uh, there you can check out uh, projects, um, his books, sketches, and also his blog as well. So uh, that's FrancoisLevy.com. And I want to mention, i also plug uh, his uh, latest book, BIM in Small Scale Sustainable Design. It is the leading guide in the field um, that addresses the latest technological tools in BIM, sustainable design, and um, integrated practice too. So uh, if you guys have a chance, uh, definitely find that on Amazon.com somewhere. Yeah, cool. Um, also, uh, Barbara, do you want to take over here and uh, plug yes. our blog and Facebook page? Yes, thank you so much, Francois. I could tell you are a little bit of a celebrity in the architecture world. And um, anyway, I just want to remind everybody to visit our Novaj blog because um, we're really always on the edge of information, technology, um, and everything that matters in architecture. This week, for instance, we got a great interview with the, the architects behind the Blue Planet, the new National Aquarium in Denmark. It's, you've seen pictures everywhere, and we got to talk to the guys, so check it out. And also, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and get the latest scoop on all that goes on and uh, if you want to, you know, latest news on our products and our webinar special and promos. Next week, the, I remind you that our webinars will be with MacSoft and their new releases, uh, CanCap, CADCAM software, Visual CAD CAM 2014. And this new version that features five modules, uh, which are fully integrated into one software interface, um, so that in this webinar we'll showcase each of the modules and demonstrate their new features and functionality. This webinar is always free and will last about an hour, including Q&A session. Sign up to follow our webinars uh, at www.novage.com webinar 103. Today's webinar is being recorded live, so if you want to rewatch this incredible episode in its entirety, always uh, find us on uh, Novage Webinar Series channel through Vimeo and YouTube. Thank you very much, everybody. Cool. Um, yes, yeah, so you can find us on uh, Facebook, Google Plus, and also on Twitter at Novage. Um, so to end this quickly, um, Francois, do you have any last words before we sign up on this? Uh, no, I just uh, really encourage everybody to use VectorWorks and explore the tools, both the, three, the freeform modeling and the parametric objects. Uh, really worth a little extra investment in time to you know, learn those tools and use them. Um, really great product. Thank you. Very cool. All right, in that case, uh, on behalf of uh, Novedge, I want to thank everybody for joining us. So um, signing off, ciao. Have a good one. <laughs>